Meat Boy is back. Today I'm going to show you guys how to cook a roast in the oven and this can be applied to any reasonably large cut of meat whether it's top round for roast beef, eye round, chuck roast, brisket, beef belly, you name it. The two principles we're going to go over today will help you get a nice brown crust flavorful on the outside as well as a juicy, rare, medium rare, evenly cooked inside. Let me show you guys how I do it. Traditional roast beef is always made with the top round cut. Here I actually have some veal top round that we have on Frankie's free range meat. If you get a beef top round, it's actually gonna be a lot bigger and you're gonna maybe even have to cut it in half. If you wanna roast a different cut of meat, I mean, there's plenty of stuff to choose from, eye round, a chuck. But the reason I really like top round is because it reminds me of that typical classic roast beef flavor, as in like the, the deli slices of roast beef that you're used to eating as a kid. Uh, so we have cap on here, which means there is a protective layer of fat, and that'll help us get some caramelization. It'll add some flavor. This is the real important trick that I'm showing you guys. You know, this is the main reason you're watching this video is to dry brine the roast as far in advance as you can, you know, up to three days in advance. Uh, we're gonna do this one for about 16 hours, and all we need to do for a dry brine is cover all of it in salt. And this is gonna do two things primarily. It's gonna season the meat throughout, and it's gonna dry out the surface so we can get a crust much easier. And normally, you have to use a pan or a grill to get a very nice crust on something, but when it's gonna be nice and dry, it crisps up in the oven without having to sear it. It's nice to just to be able to throw a roast in the oven, hook it all the way through, get it nice and brown, as opposed to firing up another cooking surface. Keep in mind, this is the bare minimum. You could crack a lot of pepper on here, use various herbs like thyme and rosemary, you know, cover it in fish sauce. This is Colatura di Alisi, AKA garum. It's a Roman style fermented anchovy sauce. We now have this on Frankie's free range meat. You could even brine this in bone broth. Get really creative. The main factor here is that dry brine that dries out the surface and the salt that seasons it throughout. As long as those two factors are present, whatever other seasonings you use, this is gonna turn out great. So the top round is liberally covered with salt. I'm gonna pop this in the fridge for the next 16 hours and I'll see you guys when we're ready to roast it. So our veal top round roast has sat in the fridge overnight and as you could tell, you know, the surface is very, very dry. What we're gonna do now is pop this in the oven for a couple hours at 250 degrees, get the internal temperature to where we want it, around 115, and then we're gonna take it out of the oven, turn the heat up, throw it back in, Get a nice brown crust on the outside. I know I said the dry brining was the most important part, really making sure to season ahead of time, but it's not. You don't have to do that, although I deem it as fairly necessary to get a quality roast. This is where the technique really comes in, getting the correct internal temperature. And this is way different than cooking a steak because a roast holds a lot more heat, obviously due to its size. So normally for a rare steak, you would want the internal temperature to be around 120 degrees. For a roast, you want to go much lower. If you go to 120 degrees internal temperature for a roast, that roast will cook up to like 130 in some cases, 135, and you'll have a well done roast as opposed to a rare steak. So we want to be really mindful. I'm going to go for around, you know, 112, 113 degrees internal temperature. If you want like a medium, medium well roast, you would go for around 118, and if you wanted something medium rare, maybe 115, 116. So this is where it really helps to have a probe thermometer that we're gonna put in the not so thickest part of the meat, or an instant read thermometer, which is slightly more accurate. Now you have the thickest part of the roast in the center, and you have slightly thinner points on the outside. The problem here is, if you put this directly in the center, this outside is going to be way overcooked before the internal temperature is correct. So what we want to actually do is find a fairly thin part, like right here. And then worst case scenario, you know, the inside's a little underdone. You know, you, you can't reverse overcooking the meat, but we can always put it in a little longer. As you guys can see, the internal temperature on the left here is 34 degrees. Very cold because it came straight out of the fridge. You could do this at room temperature, but 
since we are cooking this very low and slow at 250 degrees, it's not necessary. It might just take a little longer from the fridge as opposed to room temperature. And the reason we want to do this at 250 degrees, even less if you could, you know, if you could do 225, if you're really, really patient to cook it at 200, you know, six, seven, eight hours, by all means, you can do that. But once you go above 250 to like 325, 350 degrees, what ends up happening is, you know, the outer part of the roast gets really overcooked when the inside is still raw. So the lower the temperature, the nicer the roast is going to be on the inside, the less gray. Uh, so we're going to start at 250 and it's 945 right now on this clock. This could take a while, two and a half, three hours, but keep a really good eye on it because what will happen is it'll take a really long time for the temperature to start moving. But once it does, it'll be done in about half an hour. It's 11:15 now. It's been an hour and a half and our internal temperature on the probe thermometer is reading 82 degrees. One thing I've learned from overcooking too much meat is never trust one thermometer. We're going to double check with our instant read thermometer. So my internal temperature on the instant read thermometer is about the same, uh, maybe a few degrees higher. So we just got to keep in mind to take it out a little bit early. And if any of you guys like don't have these thermometers and are concerned about the cost, I think these are like 15, 20 bucks each. And that will save you from overcooking one meal worth twice as much as that. You know, this meat is not cheap. You know, you spend 50, 60, 70, $80 on a roast and you overcook it once, you could have already paid for two thermometers, three thermometers, even more. Uh, so this is definitely the best investment I've made, especially in regards to cooking meat for my family because I mostly eat raw meat. If it's seared on the outside, I eat it. That's what I like. I like the meat to be completely raw in the middle, but most people and these recipes, I'm making them approachable. So this is a temperature we're cooking this to that just about everyone would eat. So we want to keep an eye on this now because the temperature is really going up quickly. We should be to 112 degrees within the hour. I've been working out so you guys get a little eye candy. We're at 111 right now, so let's turn this off and let's check with the instant read thermometer. Yeah, we're at about 112 on the spot, so let's take this out and we're gonna let it rest for 45 minutes an hour. So there's the roast. A little bit of browning already on it. So now what you wanna do is crank the oven as hot as it gets or about as hot as it gets. We're gonna do 500, my oven goes up to 550. So what's gonna happen is this meat's gonna rest, cool off, the temperature's gonna lower, that oven's gonna get really, really hot. So when this is cool and we pop it back in, we can get a nice crust on the outside without cooking the inside any further. So our roast has been sitting for about half an hour. It's warm to the touch now, it's definitely not hot. And you guys could see, if I rub my fingers over this, the fat is coming off and I can rub that fat onto the, the drier meat parts of the roast. So that's kind of what we want to do here because if the roast is dry on any part without fat on it, it's not really going to caramelize that nicely. So what I like doing here is just as a bit of insurance, I'll take some butter. This is a uh, Finlandia grass fed butter on Frankie's free range meat. By all means, if you can get butter from a raw local farm, that's great. But, you know, I prefer using the more affordable butter for cooking, anything that's being heated. And if you were really crazy, you know, before when we were dry browning this, you could have flipped this over, you know, made sure that this side got nice and dry too. We're gonna pop this in that furnace hot oven like this. See if this side crisps up and then we'll flip it over. So we'll put this in the top, close to the burners, see if it dries up the top. About five minutes, we'll check on it. Bottom side is a bit too wet to caramelize. So we're gonna flip this over. So this, pop it back in. Let it go for about seven minutes. So it's been about seven minutes, and even if we don't get like a super brown crust all around, we don't really wanna leave this in longer than that because it's gonna start cooking again on the inside and we don't want that. And as you can see, we got you know, some nice browning and this has definitely developed those deep roasted flavors. Put the rest of this butter on here, just let it melt. Let those juices drip down into the rack. You don't really have to let this rest. It's completely up to you. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you all have 
you know, different degrees of temperature and different degrees of juices flowing out. I'm gonna let this sit for about an hour because I have to finish my workout and then we'll slice it open. Top rounds have been resting for a bit. It is hot to the touch, just about the perfect temperature. I reserved the butter, fat, and cooking juices as I removed it from the roasting tray. Now we're gonna slice this for presentation. So these end pieces, yeah, I mean, if you have a dog, that's what I would feed them to. I mean, they're still perfectly good to eat if you like the meat that's a little more cooked. But until you get, you know, two or three slices in, it's gonna be a little over. So see, that piece is much better. And I'm gonna put these like this in a ceramic pan. Of course, you could cut this however thick or thin you want. You feel the middle here. This is very, very, very rare. Perfect temperature, just how I like it. Most people would probably want veal cooked a little more, maybe to, you know, instead of 112, you wanna go to like 115, 116. The main reason I like doing these roasts so much is it's food for two or three days. And when you're on a carnivore diet, that means, you know, taking away five or six meals where you have to cook, which saves a lot of time. You know, I'll have this sitting in my fridge. I'll just take a few slabs out at a time and reheat them. And roasts tend to taste better. You know, a day or two after you cook them, the night after you cook it, the meat tastes even better. You know, it's not like other foods where you want them to be fresh to taste good. You know, this stuff, I usually just throw it in a freezer bag and save it for stocks. And there we have it, guys. Our perfectly medium rare roast with juices at the bottom that you can drizzle over. And this is some more fat and juices that I'll just pour over. And if you want, you know, you can add a little bit more butter when you go to eat it. But this is going to be really tasty, really delicious. I'm sure you guys will love it. Add some horseradish, uh, aged balsamic vinegar, whatever toppings you like. Uh, so you can get the veal top run on Frankie's Free Range Meat or just, you know, use whatever roast is uh, more affordable at your local butcher. You guys know how to support me through the other various methods down in the description below. I'll see you guys for tomorrow's video as well as live stream.